Vijay Sama is an independent journalist who has worked with some of the best names in Indian journalism like The Patriot, The Pioneer and The Indian Express. He has managed newsrooms and also helped launch two English magazines, The Sunday Indian and The Caravan. He is currently the executive editor of the New Delhi Financial World and Tehelka.com. Today, he is on Talking Matters to share how this world of his fell apart and how he is not just a journalist now, but also a passionate sobriety campaigner. You are a sobriety campaigner. There's a lot of passion involved in what you do. Why did you decide to get involved in this manner? My interest in sobriety came in after I came into recovery from alcoholism and addiction. And the manner of my coming into recovery convinced me that uh, this is something everybody must know because it didn't have to do just with alcoholism and addiction. It had to do with life, with relationships, with work, with career, with emotions. So that's when I was deeply interested because it was the first time I understood a lot about life. And then I see around me all my friends, a lot of friends in India. It's a vast problem in India. So uh, I realized that there is a lot of work to be done in this area in India. And the future projections indicate that it's going to be more and more uh, intense, the work in this field. So which is why I decided to move from journalism to sobriety campaigning. I now do about 70% sobriety campaign work, 30% I do journalism work. Another big reason for making the shift at this point was the response to Amir Khan Satyamev Jete. I got calls from nine nations, uh, meaning Indians in nine countries, called me. You know, while we thought that Amir is a big uh, actor and he has a big footprint, and we thought probably many places in, in India would respond. But this took me by surprise when I got calls from Indians across eight countries, nine countries. And all of them wanted help or had something to say. So I was convinced I was on the right track. I was taking the right decision. And since then, uh, I've done far more work than I've done in, in a couple of years of journalism before that. And you can see we are here talking today about this, which only goes to show uh, how vast and widespread the work is. But this level of personal involvement, do you think it has also been influenced by what you have been through yourself, that you've had uh, a personal problem with alcohol as well as drugs? Absolutely. I mean, if I hadn't been through what I, what I did uh, because of drugs and alcohol, I don't think I would have understood sobriety as well as I do now. So when I speak to people, I wouldn't have the same conviction or understanding or insights and therefore the conversation wouldn't have the same impact. I would probably be a do-gooder, like many people are, but my work as a sobriety campaigner takes on a whole new meaning because of the journey I've had through life. I mean, today we're able to sit and speak nicely in a civilized way, but there was a time that I was a human rat. Uh, you wouldn't have seen me at this time. So anyone who goes through all those experiences uh, I think there's a sort of transformation that takes place. Your priorities sort of fall into place. And that's, that may have been what happened with me as well. Your dark face was incredibly dark. I mean, you were very talented with so much to offer to your community where you come from. There were very high expectations of you. But it was a really dark face. If you could tell us what you actually had to go through, share your experience of that period. Yeah. See, um... It's something which uh, nobody understood. Even I didn't understand until I came into recovery what was happening with me. Uh, I come from, or I came from a middle class family with high levels of dignity, high levels of intelligence and uh, lots of values, respect. So in my family and in my community of, uh, by community I mean school, college, city, in the south of India, in Hyderabad, I was considered a person who would do a lot as I grew. There were huge expectations from me. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I uh, kind of drifted from family and my whole world changed. Now that change uh, influenced me profoundly. My first encounter with the substance, whether it was alcohol and later uh, smack, transformed me totally. 
Now that took me into a different world and the periodicity kept increasing. Uh, I think I was what about late 14 or maybe early 15 when I first had alcohol. So it, I'm talking of a very early phase, just out of school and then started. So that transformation took me away from home and then the periodicity kept increasing. Now since I wasn't earning, now the money demands were high, there was continuous tension at home. So a family which was once widely respected was now being embarrassed on a daily basis because of my activities. So I mean they, I, I, my relationships deteriorated, I was thrown out of home, I had to come back to the same gang, I was on, already looking for all kinds of money, so I tried to raise money in many ways. So my family was tired of me and they had they found the only way was to get this guy out of the city, which they did. So my first stint with some sort of a rehab was in 1984. Now we are talking about a time when India didn't understand rehab very much. And uh, so there was an, uh, an asylum for the mentally unsound in uh, Sikandrabad, Hyderabad. And, uh, there they emptied the paid ward and put addicts there to understand the problem. So that was the first instance when I encountered all this part, you know, moving among killers, rapists, totally deranged. Uh, I left the center very soon. Obviously. So from there, it, I was totally on my own, on the streets. Now it's been about, I would say, um, if you give or take, almost 20 years of what you described as a dark phase. Wow. Now this included homelessness, this included um, loss of status, a lot of dignity, health, economy, relationships, family, everything. To be a human rat, you know, you got to really move through the sewers of human life, which is what I did. Uh, I would be uh, in horrific situations uh, only to avoid any human contact. Mm. And alcoholism and drugs can take you to that level. Not many people survive that. See, it's, it's almost impossible to survive emotional trauma of that nature, a mental degradation of that nature, and it's difficult for people to put their life back. So my dark phase ended in 2002, and not because I had a sudden bout of common sense and I decided, okay, now I'll turn a new leaf. No, I mean, it was because I couldn't do anything I was doing at all. I had reached the end. I had you know, stopped having a bath. Uh, I was like a vagabond on the railway platforms. You wouldn't come to me if you had seen me then. So, you know, you, you can't do that beyond a point. And already I had kind of pushed the limits to a great extent of this sort of a life as a human rat. So yes, the dark phase was horrible, but you know what? Today, I'm virtually indestructible in human terms. Mm -hmm. Now, act of the creator, I'm not in control. What happens outside of me? But because of that experience, because what adversity did to me, gives me all the strength to do all this work. I'm able to do everything to a large extent because of what I've been through. Your addiction then, what do you think caused it? Uh, the principal reason that I discovered uh, for my addiction was family dysfunction. And that is the principal reason for addiction on this planet. The second uh, most important reason for addiction is peer pressure. So both these reasons worked fully in my case. By family d dysfunction, I mean you know, there wasn't very great, healthy, emotional connect in my family. Mm -hmm. Everybody was very sensitive, so they didn't know how to express things to each other. Mm -hmm. So they would not say things in the open. Everything would be implied. And therefore, I grew up learning to be hypersensitive and hyper alert, always trying to second guess what was being said or not said and what was being meant. So this put me in a state of almost permanent alertness. Now that causes a great deal of stress in a human being. Where you, where you do, where, what I'm talking about is a certain lack of faith and trust in your own folk. Not because they're consciously doing anything, mm -hmm. but that's the way it was. So it's very important for a family to function properly. And not just in terms of livelihood. Relationships are very important. So that drove me away from them. In that state of mind, 
when the substance came, it transformed me magically. And it had a profound effect on me. I felt totally in control. I felt absolutely like I was in a new world, which I loved. Mm -hmm. Now, this happened both with alcohol and with my first encounter with smack. Same thing, I was transformed. The family dysfunction operates fully in my case. Then we are talking about peer pressure. The substance was introduced in my life in both cases, in, in fact, every case, by friends. I had never gone out to buy liquor until very late in my alcoholism. All the series of uh, drinking episodes in my life for the first few years were parties hosted by friends or alcohol brought by friends. Mm. The same with brown sugar. The first few series of the time I took it was given to me by friends who said, let's try this, it's a great substance. So peer pressure worked as well. To belong to the gang where I was, was to listen to the same music, was to bunk the same classes, was to feel the same very rebellious stars. You know, so you got to do all those things together. It was your world. Mm. The third reason that operated in my case was my own personality. Because of this hypersensitivity which I described to you, it causes distortion in a person's personality. Anybody who is in that position will learn to trust only himself. So the emotional profile of that person gets seriously distorted. Mm. So I don't know how to deal with anger. I don't know how to deal with joy. I don't know how to deal with sadness. In fact, any situation that crops up was a test. So in each situation, I fell back on my substance, mm. which was like a lovely relationship. It was always there for you. Exactly. It was always there for me and it always delivered for me. Mm. Each time I took it, I was transformed, ecstatic. You know, felt totally in control, which is not the case with people at home. Every time, you know, they don't, there's something on and off between human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, that thing I hadn't learned because I got into the substance very early. Mm -hmm. So my emotional growth, which should happen with every human being in the teens, did not happen with me. I grew with the substance. Mm -hmm. So these three principal reasons operated. My own personality disorder, serious emotional uh, vulnerability, mm -hmm. Family dysfunction and peer pressure pushed me into this magical world which was great initially and then horrible for very long after that. Now you've been sober for a decade. 2002 you stopped. Has it been easy for you? I mean this emotional makeup, that's the most difficult part to work on. Is it still challenging for you? Do you have to work on it every day or did it come easily to you? See, uh, you've said something perfect almost. You said the emotional recovery is the most difficult part. It is so, actually. With everyone who has a problem with alcoholism and addiction, this is where they trip. So it wasn't easy for me. But uh, I had a fine mentor. And please remember, I was completely down in the dumps. I had nothing left in me. I had stopped eating for months before I went to this friend uh, to borrow money. So physically, I was almost dead. Emotionally, I was anywhere gone, shot to pieces much earlier. There wasn't a single human being who wanted to connect with me, except the peddlers, and only if I paid. So I had no option. I had hit solidly what is described as rock bottom. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that helped. How did I understand my emotional profile? How did I work on that? I understood that with uh, sessions with my mentor that this is a very deep reason for my addiction. And even today, I have uh, issues with anger. Mm -hmm. I have issues with perfectionism. Because I, uh, uh, for a large part of my life, I could do things perfectly. You know, you put me in a room even today, there are many things I can do perfectly. So, that caused perfectionism in me, which means I expect everyone to be of a certain standard in anything they do. Now, that's not possible in human interaction. So it causes tension, it causes stress. Mm -hmm. And I, get, I have angry bouts, mm -hmm. bouts of anger. So anger still is an issue with me. But I have worked on my esteem, self-esteem, uh, quite greatly. I've been able to recover my self-esteem to a large extent. Mm -hmm. Now it does not fluctuate very much between low self-esteem and high self-esteem. Mm -hmm. It's sort of normal self-esteem, which keeps me calm for large portions of the day. And I have uh, had great support 
from my wife of uh, almost five years and uh, she is a recovery bride to, so to say but she's been a great support mm -hmm. so it helps me uh, be grounded these are the reasons why I'm able to be so calm today able to function with instant clarity in any situation this is uh, a big reason and a person who is unable to work on his or her emotional issues is a prime candidate for a relapse. We will get to that uh, relapse in a bit, but before we move on, because what you were pointing out, the factors that uh, sort of influenced your addiction, one was how it was harmless partying with friends, you know, yes. it was harmless drinking of alcohol. Yes. Then where, when do you cross the line into becoming an alcoholic? Then who is an alcoholic? Okay, now this is something quite important. Uh, it's always like that. It usually starts for fun. You know, you just have friends and you do that. But I would put it in very simple way so that people must understand, especially the youngsters. Uh, first thing is, people who start with a substance late in life, by late I mean say after 27, mm -hmm. have a low risk of becoming an alcoholic or an addict. People who start early in the teens are high risk candidates to be full blown alcoholics and addicts. So how do we know they're alcoholics or addicts? The first marker is your very first encounter with the substance. Anybody who's had a sip the first time in his or her life of alcohol will tell you how it was with normal people who do not have an addictive personality. For instance, if you were to drink or if you were to recall your first sip, if you did have a sip, You'll probably, I mean, a normal person like you would think of horrible taste. <laughs> ah, it'll be pungent, it'll be bitter, and it'll burn. Mm -hmm. You want to throw up, there's nausea. There's nothing about it you like, alcohol. It's not ice cream. So a normal person would register these things. It is possible that you might even have thrown up first time. Most normal people do. This is the memory that the substance creates in them the first time. In a person like me, wow, what a feeling. You know, when it went in, it transformed me. The warmth, the kind of excellent, I am the king. Now, I remember the transformation. I didn't register the bitter taste. I didn't register the burning sensations. I didn't register the pungent aftertaste, no. For me, it was instant connect, the transformation. This is what happens with many people. That's the first indicator. What am I talking about? This is what an alcoholic or an addict will keep going back to. The second time a person has a drink or a joint or an injection, could be much later. But this is what drives them, this feeling. Yes. A normal person won't do it because you will say, no, I don't like it, it was horrible. So that's the first indicator. You, you're describing an addictive personality yes. then. You said, how do we know who's an alcoholic? Mm -hmm. An alcoholic is a person who gets transformed by alcohol. Mm -hmm. First. How do you know he's been transformed or she's been transformed? They know it. Mm -hmm. They know instantly. And their response to the substance indicates whether they are going to be high-risk candidates to become alcoholics later in life. If you're transformed by the substance, you have an alcoholic personality. Now it becomes a mood changer. What it has done is it's altered your mood. So it's an instant recognition of any personality. If you have a friend or if you see youngsters, this is the first marker. Now what comes next? How do we know who's an alcoholic? Because people drink socially and all that. If concern has been raised by anyone around you at any point about your drinking, then you probably have an alcoholic tendency. If you drink normally, if you're a safe drinker, no one around you will say, hang on, that maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Why do they say it? Because they see people throw up after they drink, getting drunk. Instances of getting drunk are an indicator of an alcoholic personality. A normal person does not get drunk, even if they have had an experience of excess alcohol just once, they won't repeat it. An alcoholic personality will go back to the substance even after they've thrown up at a party, let's say the previous night. There's a party, you're drinking, you've thrown up. That is a negative experience. That's not normal. 
or an alcoholic will go back to the substance the next chance he gets. He will rationalize. Oh, maybe the stuff was bad, maybe I mixed my drinks, maybe I should have eaten some food. That's when you know that this person has an alcoholic personality. No, it's fine when you know that that person has an alcoholic personality, but then that person will never accept that yes. that person is an alcoholic. Yes, yes. That person will need a little more problem. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, he, now he doesn't listen when you're saying, maybe you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. He doesn't listen. Then he will continue to do more. And then the negative consequences come in. So, therefore, if you're asking me, how does a person know whether he or she is an alcoholic? The very first encounter should tell them yes. that, look, I've fallen in love with the substance. Mm -hmm. That itself is the first indication. It, so you don't pay heed. Mm -hmm. That's the second indication mm -hmm. when people tell you. These are all things that a person knows. But part of being an alcoholic is to deny. So they will continue to drink destructively. So therefore, it may not be very easy for an alcoholic to put an end to his drinking by himself or herself. But if these things are understood by the youngsters, who we think they should, we are talking now largely because of youngsters, I'm talking to you about my experience as a youngster. If this goes, gets across to them, that when they start thinking, do I love this substance? I mean, am I using it to transform my moods? Yes, if the answer is yes, then avoid it. It's a normal thing. I mean, you drink safe, it doesn't do anything to you. It's like having a cup of tea or maybe you're having a soft drink. Mildly you'll enjoy, but nothing more. You're not transformed. A person who's transformed has an alcoholic personality. And from what you're saying right now, that um, the dependency decreases once you are over the age of 27. You will also have a campaign, um, not until 27 in India. Yes. Why did I mention 27 and why did I say that late entry of substance into a person's life uh, will probably help? Mm. There are reasons for that. The first reason is that it, was, it wasn't very well understood until this year uh, about the capacity of the human mind. Largely it is understood and it's still true that the most important years are 0 to 5. Soon after a child is born, up to the fifth year, whatever happens in that child's life, whether female or male, forms the personality of that child and there's nothing you can do about it. That would be about 90%. Now recent studies have said, have shown that the human mind has capacity to adapt until the age of 26. It may not necessarily be fully developing still or evolving at 26, but it can adapt still at the age of 26. Earlier it was thought that it would have stopped even adapting much earlier. Mm -hmm. yes. So, that principal reason tells us now that there's no sense in destroying your brain before it is fully formed, when it's still adapting. So 27, if you delay taking a substance till 27, you give the chance of uh, preventing brain damage in your own existence and you give yourself a great shot at a happy, nice life. So that was the first thing that prompted this thinking. Mm -hmm. The second thing that prompted it, it was my own experience and studies which show that 90% of addiction starts from the teens, whether it is addiction to alcohol or to any other narcotic. That was the second reason. One was brain damage. Second one was the simple thing that a late starter mm -hmm. is probably a safe drinker. And the third more important thing was simple psyche of a youngster. You try to talk to a youngster and tell them, don't do something, they will do exactly that. So we've seen that by saying, say no to drugs. I mean, it's a 40 year old message. Say no to alcohol is 40 years old and it hasn't worked. It's got worse and worse and worse. So I figured, look, I'm not going to tell them no. I'm only going to ask them to delay it. And it worked. This slogan I was able to coin and go into public in September in Dehradun in India. The response of youngsters, I'm talking purely of 18 to 21 age group, the most important age group in addiction and alcoholism. A whole hall full of them fired questions at me for an hour. They wanted to know, why did you say 27? What is this brain thing you're talking about? What is the risk percentage? How does it lower if I start late? You know, it was... And I knew instantly that if a youngster is asking you questions, it means you've reached him. 
Exactly. Yes. And that worked very well. Mm -hmm. So that encouraged us to think in terms of a year-long campaign in India first. But this is a message which will work anywhere on earth. It will work in Bhutan, it will work in Cambodia, it will work in England. Because we're all the same. We're all youngsters. Mm -hmm. And this is the campaign that is now being put in shape. We're just getting the paperwork and the legal work done. Mm -hmm. So you will probably hear more about it in a couple of months. And we hope to come to Bhutan with the same message because India teaches us a lot. The scale of the problem is huge. We do this work and there's much that we can bring to Bhutan. Mm -hmm. This not until 27 which you asked me about is this. This is your first visit to Bhutan and you did happen to meet the Prime Minister as well and you all had a conversation on this alcohol being a problem. That was an absolute delight. This is my first visit to Bhutan and I must give full credit to uh, my friend Vishal Arora. He helped me through this. He talked to me about Bhutan. He said, look, you, maybe you can contribute here and you should because he's seen my work in, in India. So I agreed totally and we came here and he told me the Prime Minister uh, has agreed to meet us. So we were thrilled. So yesterday, uh, when I asked the Prime Minister about uh, his concerns on alcohol in Bhutan, you see, alcohol is probably the biggest threat to happiness. Or let me say addiction. Now, Bhutan is the land of happiness. It's the land of gross national happiness. So I was interested in understanding from the Prime Minister whether he thought alcohol would undermine this concept of GNH in Bhutan. Nothing else will, mind you, as much as this. So he started to talk and he said some very interesting things. First he said, look, I drink socially, but I don't understand how anybody can get addicted to this horrible tasting stuff. This was exactly what he said. Now, why is he saying that? Because he has a normal personality. He is registering the awful taste of alcohol, but it's not about that. It's about the emotions and the feeling that alcohol generates in an addictive personality. So that gave me an insight when the Prime Minister said that. The other thing the Prime Minister of Bhutan mentioned, which was significant, was his problems and his government's problems uh, in going ahead with policies that might uh, make alcohol a risky proposition to its people, to the people of Bhutan. What they're trying to do is make it more difficult for people of Bhutan to keep drinking. So he says, but you know, we've encountered resistance. We were seen as violators of human rights. We were seen as people who were trying to control people's lives. Which is true, the government or any government and the government of Bhutan as well can only do so much. You can raise taxes, you can make it the costliest luxury, which you can do. But you will also need to do a little more. You will need to try and restrict the number of shops. Because if it is as easily available as tea, there's nothing you can do. There is a recent study, if I could share with you, uh, which fall in that study, researchers followed 55,000 Finns people from Finland. 55,000 Finns were followed for seven years in that study. And that study proved that if you, uh, if you come a kilometer closer to a liquor wind, the chances of you becoming an alcoholic increase by 17% wow, per kilometer. Yes. Now look at that. Until this study came through, we did not have scientific data on this issue. Now, Bhutan uh, does a lot of home brewing, and I've seen... Uh, there are bars. Every second yeah. place is a bar. Yes. yes. Uh, and uh, Vishal had mentioned this to me, and I noticed it after that, that everything is restaurant kambar, kambar or something kambar. Forget that. We, we had tea this morning, after we jogged a bit and did a bit of workout in this wonderful place. We had tea, and along with tea, rows and rows of alcohol in a tea shop. Now, this is a problem as well, but that also in itself won't help you. What you need are some big rock-bottom cases. So if you have somebody who may be a social figure who has gone totally uh, to seed, then that must be highlighted. Mm. I've heard stories of prominent people in Bhutan who've had this problem, but if the media, you uh, and others in the media, talk about this, and when people register that even our important icons in Bhutan are destroying themselves and have, this has happened, that will help too. The Prime Minister, I think, is prob as far as I understand, is uh, probably only the two or three Prime Ministers on earth today mm -hmm. speak about alcoholism as an issue in their country. And Bhutan is fortunate to have a government headed by a person who actually speaks about it more than once. It was a public uh, thing where we spoke yesterday, then we spoke in private as well. Mm -hmm. So Bhutan needs a government campaign. I haven't seen any 
yet. Because it's only going to get worse. You know, lots of youngsters are going to drink. And the only way to reach them is with messages. The messages reach better when you have an iconic figure saying that. You know, so people, youngsters especially, register that more. That's one thing you can probably do. Another thing you can probably do is to have a world-class rehab concept in Bhutan. For that, of course, you'll need some help. Mm. Now, fortunately, I've been doing a lot of that. And I, uh, part of the discussions here in Bhutan revolved around how we can help Bhutan. Mm. Because we bring with us, I mean, I bring with me a lot of affection and ability. And I actually lived this whole thing. So uh, I could help in a lot of ways, uh, build capacity in Bhutan. So family dysfunction is something that you, Bhutan should pay attention to. It's great, it's the land of happiness. Mm -hmm. But you must be very careful whether in that general thing of happiness you're missing the important markers that suggest to you that maybe we should look at the family closely. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need help. A home brewing is not a great idea. I'm not it would be quite tricky here in Bhutan, knowing how alcohol is very um, intrinsic to Bhutanese culture. I mean, it's there as part of offerings, our national game, the archery. Most people are drinking through the course of the game, from the beginning to the end. I mean, it's there everywhere. It's a part of our culture, so it could be quite difficult to actually say, oh, you know, you have to get everything out, alcohol. or Like you were saying, for me, I think personally, I think education is important. Yes. That a person should be educated enough to make the choice. Absolutely. No, you can't control people's lives. There's no concept of prohibition working. You can't ban things and expect people to go with you. No. Government can only do this much. Government can make people aware through campaigns. Mm -hmm. It can raise taxes to make it more difficult for you. It can set a few guidelines by which not every tea shop necessarily has to sell booze. That's it. Beyond that, it is through um, television shows like this, it is through the media, it is through horrifying instances and examples before us, in Bhutan specifically, that will probably make people think. And it's only, it's an individual choice after all. It's not national policy to promote liquor or anything. It's people are making an individual choice. And we must respect that individual choice. And the more we tell them about the issue, the better they are. Uh, to, uh, in a better position to make a decision. And when you keep highlighting addictive personality, different from a normal person, then it brings home the fact that this is a, an illness, this is not something that is ordinary, this is sometimes also beyond your control because people tend to assume that alcoholism is a personal choice, that you drive yourself to becoming an alcoholic. But then how you highlighted that, you know, the tendency is greater when you have an addictive personality, it is difficult, then it leads to a host of other problems that you have to treat like a normal illness. Yes. Uh, addiction to alcohol or any substance is the only disease that is seen as a character flaw. Much earlier, when you didn't have uh, medicine which is advanced so far, in the early stages of human life, sexually transmitted diseases were similarly seen also as a moral flaw. But you don't, you know, look down on a cancer patient, for instance, or a heart patient. But you will tend to look down on an alcoholic or an addict. Because part of the disease is because they did it so much. They overdid the substance so much. That's part of the problem. Mm. So it's very tricky. Most people don't get this, that it's not just a test of character. As you rightly said, there are things beyond a person's control. Like I mentioned, the first response to a substance may be happening because of a host of reasons already which have come into a person's life and that person doesn't understand it at a young age. So the WHO long ago categorized alcoholism and addiction as a disease. Unfortunately, so many decades hence, there is no cure for this. There's only treatment available. So you get into treatment. Treatment is possible through counseling, through social intervention, through uh, rehabs, where you, a decent rehab, I mean, where you have a safe and secure environment for a few months to alter your thinking and lifestyle. So this disease concept hasn't even yet been accepted by a nation like India. So it, will, it might take time for other nations to accept. So not everybody treats it as a disease. Because if the government did, then the government will have to provide facilities to treat that disease, you see. You can't sack people for alcoholism, for instance. That's a big thing in government offices and defense forces. 
So you'll have to stop supplying the substance, which they do now in subsidy to the armed forces. If it's a disease, then you can't be seen as propagating the disease. So there are a lot of intricacies involved, which is why governments don't necessarily notify it as a disease, mm -hmm. as they would notify malaria or typhoid as a disease. India has not notified alcoholism or addiction as a disease yet. Mm -hmm. So this is something that needs to be uh, made aware to a lot more people. And uh, so the government of Bhutan also probably will take its time and see the pros and cons and what it means to notify this as a disease. Mm -hmm. But it is a disease. Yesterday when you met for a conversation, you were uh, talking about um, the kind of professions that one is that is also a sort of a hindrance when you want to um, mm. check yourself into rehab. And it was very interesting for me because we do have a lot of Bhutanese who have very um, good professions, doctors, then we have lawyers, uh, not so much in our, uh, as in our religious figures, but then we do have these very well-educated people who come from really good backgrounds. And to me, I was like, why? I mean, these these people would know better and then you had something very interesting to say to me. <laughs> see, everybody thought I knew better, you see? Journalist. Yeah, yes. no, no one you meet in my life who knew me would think that I don't know anything. Uh, so it's amazing how easily human beings confuse skill at a particular thing as being an adequate human being. What I mean by that, you could be a great banker for instance, you could be a great lawyer. You could be very skilled at that part of your life, but that does not necessarily make you an adequate human being or a perfect human being. Uh, it's a peculiar thing you mentioned, and uh, we have found through our experience in sobriety work that there are four professions specifically, or four categories of people who have difficulty getting into recovery. Uh, these were, we found, uh, journalists, which means people from the media fraternity, we found um, people, or largely men of religion, they were women also, but largely men of religion, uh, which means priests and so on. Then we found doctors, men of medicine, doctors having great difficulty uh, getting into recovery. And we found men from the legal, people from the legal fraternity, lawyers. So lawyers, doctors, journalists and priests seem to have the most difficulty getting into recovery. Mm -hmm. Now, as you said, you would naturally expect them to know better. Mm -hmm. Now, we found reasons for this. We try to understand why. Um, it's not actually a scientific study, but when we tried to talk to as many people as we could and try to figure out why, these were the insights we got. Mm -hmm. Doctors tend to think that they know more about diseases, and so they're, they're closed when you talk to them about the disease of alcoholism. They don't understand, they don't let that get in. Plus, we also found that doctors have far easier access to all sorts of non-alcoholic drugs than a normal person. They prescribe these drugs. And I have known of horrific cases where doctors have told me the kind of operations they've conducted under the influence. In India, we hear horrific cases of misbehavior by men of medicine in hospitals. This is a dangerous thing. Doctors, are quite a large percentage of them, tend to be under the influence. And they don't come out. This is not to say anything about men of medicine, they save lives. I'm only talking of people who have this problem. And therefore, they never agree with what you tell them. And they keep doing the substance. Because A, they have easy access, B, they think they know more mm -hmm. about the disease. So they don't respond even as they near the graveyard. That's a tragic situation with doctors. Priests, when you start to describe the spiritual part of the disease, which means essentially the spiritual part of the disease of addiction, whether to alcohol or drugs, mm. simply means an erosion of your value system. Mm. You're no longer able to relate to human beings. You start to steal time. Mm. You start to steal all the good things in life and put it into the substance. It could be love, it could be affection, it could be work, whatever. Mm. And you put it into the substance. That part they don't get. They don't understand the erosion of value system. They think it's a thing to do with God. And they know more about God than anybody else. So they don't listen to what you have to say. Now we have lawyers. By the very nature of the profession, they tend to argue about everything. You tell them, you know, you shouldn't do this, or this is the problem if you do this, they will have a counter for everything. It's, uh, we found, uh, almost impossible to get through to a lawyer. Reason doesn't work with lawyers, especially lawyers who have alcohol issues and drug issues. They too tend to die rather than come into recovery. And then we have journalists. 
a large percentage of journalists in India, especially in Delhi where I'm based, have a problem with uh, alcohol, some with drugs. But the nature of a journalist's life, his career, means that he's always monitoring the world around him or her. And journalists are usually considered highly opinionated. They think they know what is correct about everything. Most, most of the time they do. But what happens is a lifetime of doing this robs them of the opportunity to take a, just step back and look at their own lives. So there are a lot of journalists who work hard and drink hard. The work hard part keeps them away from family. The drink hard part keeps them away from family and makes the family unhappy. So these are the four categories of people. Any Bhutanese who falls in these four categories or families of people who fall in these four categories who are drinking in an unsafe fashion should immediately be alert. It could go a long way, uh, you know, if they don't get a grip on themselves now. But then it's difficult then. I mean, how do you help people like that? It's fine to set up rehabilitation centers, but how do you get people like that to go into the rehab centers then? First and foremost, we need to reach them. We are, we, are, we are putting together drives targeted at specific professions. For instance, we are planning a campaign with lawyers. We are planning a campaign with doctors. We are planning a campaign with teachers. So you have to identify specific things with call center employees. Any new profession that's catching on or any profession. So society must have a sense. You know, you, there must be a ready list available that, okay, these are the kind of categories of work that are available in Bhutan and people fall largely on, in this. And you have drives targeted at that. Mm. Secondly, they themselves must be ready to help, you know. I mean, there's no point trying to force recovery on anyone. So it's not going to happen entirely from the outside. But uh, if you have specific campaigns, we found they work a little better. When you reach their place, of work in their environment and you talk to them and the even more important is I'm sorry I don't know how else to put it but if there is one horror story that helps far more than 50 do good messages what do I mean by that in Britain we've all heard Amy Winehouse yes. a very popular singer great singer she died because of addiction and it was proved after that that for years what the authorities in Britain were trying to do to get youngsters to stop uh, substance abuse didn't work but after Winehouse died the way she did there's been a 7% drop in use of substances among British teenagers the horror story hits home better mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say that but uh, if, if there is a tragic story mm -hmm. then that should be told to people mm -hmm. but then everywhere all over the world that I'm talking about. The society is not very patient with people um, who have undergone rehabilitation because there are always cases of relapses and the cases of relapses are really high, even here in Bhutan. But what I see is the problem arises when we're not patient enough. I mean, the family feels, oh, this we just cannot do anything about this boy or girl and uh, there's, there's no way we can help him at all. Yes, you've raised another very important point. Relapse. It's a dreaded word in this field, in, in uh, sobriety or addiction or alcoholism. See, there are a few things about relapse we need to understand, especially any Bhutanese watching this. Relapse means there already has been a period of abstinence. A person has given up a substance for a while, and that is why we are saying he or she has relapsed, because they've gone back to it. Okay, what does that prove? That they can live without the substance. The problem is they are unable to continue to live without the substance. They can be free of it for a year or six months or whatever. So the trick is to understand why are they unable to stay sober. Now, there is another study, but this is a few years old, which showed that 80% of relapses occur in the first year of sobriety. In the first 12 months after a person gives up a substance is when 80% of relapses occur. So what is a relapse? Relapse starts much before a person actually picks up the substance again. You can see it immediately when relationship troubles begin again. For instance, I've been in a rehab and, you know, I come back home. People are happy at home. For a while, everything is hunky-dory. Then the moment I start having friction with them, meaning stress is coming back. So my chosen method of coping with that stress is to go back to the substance in the past. So I go back to the substance. 
So why is this stress coming up? The first thing that happens in recovery, when a person gets into recovery from addiction, is that you recover physically. You start to eat, your appetite returns, you start to sleep, so you regain some flesh and you look a little better. But you mentally haven't changed, you haven't changed emotionally. A lot of people mistake physical recovery for well-being. So they're willing to go back to the same life and the situations which created the stress for them in the first place. Mm. Now the thought process has not changed. Which means, if I don't agree with another person and there is some sort of an argument between us, things are unpleasant, my thought process should tell me, why is it so? Let me work on it. But an earlier thought process would drive me back to the substance. So therefore my thoughts haven't changed. So never equate physical well-being with recovery. That's a common mistake which leads people to relapse. The second and most important thing is people don't understand the emotional maturity that is required for recovery. What do I mean by that? Let's make it very simple. I started at 15, taking the substance. A person stops growing from the moment you take the substance. From 15, I grew chemically. My emotional growth stopped at 15. So all the huge chaos that happens in a teenager's life did not happen in my life because the moment I was feeling good or bad or sad about anything as teenagers do, I went back to the substance. So I numb my emotions. So I came into recovery when I was 38. What happens in recovery is, at any age you come into recovery, you go back to where you started. So at 38, emotionally, I was 15. So, what, what should I do in recovery? I should come to my emotional age of 38 as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Behave like a 38-year-old man. You know, and not shoot my mouth off, not behave crazily at every slight perceived insult, which is what teenagers do. Mm -hmm. So the emotional journey people don't make. So you have 45-year-old people coming to rehabs because of alcohol problems. In fact, the most recent case I have uh, dealt with is a 59-year-old case wow. of alcohol mm -hmm. who's come into relapse. Mm -hmm. Now, because that person is still responding like a 15-year-old or a 28-year-old or whatever, wherever they first started, mind you, if you've started when you were 20, then even at the age of 60, if you're drinking, it essentially means when you're relapsing, you're still responding like a 20-year-old 20 20 year emotionally. Yes. You haven't made that journey. Yes. That is the most difficult part. Mm -hmm. This is where people relapse. I see. That has nothing to do with the availability of the substance. Mm -hmm. In the tea shop, you're selling alcohol. No, that's not causing the relapse. It is not being caused by any reason except that that person doesn't know how to deal with a situation emotionally. He or she lacks emotional maturity. Mm -hmm. He might have developed a few muscles by working out, but there's nothing inside. There's no strength inside to help him live life. So once you address this emotional bit then, this is what um, decreases the incidences of relapse? Yes, because you're in control mm. in any situation. What is the thing that the person does most? Work or be at home. Most stressful situations are caused by work, at work or at home. It's not a stranger who's going to ruin your peace of mind to such an extent, you know. So these things, when you learn how to deal with these two situations emotionally better, you're, a mature person is simply defined as a person who is in control of his or her emotions. Mm. So in a gathering, if there is screaming and shouting, if I'm calm, I've gained emotional maturity. Mm. I don't need the substance. I'm not going to relapse. Mm. As a journalist, I sit and I talk and I work among people who are drinking all the time. It doesn't bother me because I have figured this part of my life out. So I'm far calmer. So I'm more in control of my response. This is the root cause of relapse. Of course, there will be a lot of triggers. Maybe a person doesn't like the way his wife behaves. Wife may have said something. So that shouldn't drive you back to the substance. That is a 16-year-old, 20-year-old's response. That's why people relapse. Okay. And that's why families have no patience because a family doesn't understand why this person is still behaving so crazily. Mm -hmm. So the wife is 58, let's say, of a 60-year-old person. So he expects the husband to be 60 emotionally. Mm -hmm. So they don't get it. Mm -hmm. And you see, each time something happens, a relapse happens, the people around that 
alcoholic or addict, also die. A part of them dies. A first relap, 10% dies, along with the person who goes again into rehab or goes into fellowships or whatever. Repeated relapse kill uh, your dependents or your loved ones just as much as they kill the alcoholic. They may be physically alive, but there's nothing left in them. That brings me to reintegration now. Your personal story is very interesting and in how you're a journalist. I mean, when you, when, you were, when you were in your dark phase, you actually took money from people using, your, uh, using yourself, being a journalist, as something that could be used against them, that you had information, that you had that power. You were at that place and then now you're back in society as a journalist once more. You're doing what you used to do before, but then you sort of abused that authority that you had as well. So how did you manage to reintegrate? I mean, even with your family, like how you're saying, a part of your family dies with your relapse as well. Yes. So then of course it makes relationships very difficult. So how is it that you managed to reintegrate yourself to be where you are today then? Okay. I just want to clear the first part of what you mm -hmm. said. I never traded information for money. No, not traded information, but I the I never fact. blackmailed anyone. Yes. What I had my profile mm -hmm. was that I was a very big journalist at that point of time. And people were scared of what I would write. Mm -hmm. Because they were always afraid of what I knew. You know, for a story. They would yes. have done something mm -hmm. and people wouldn't know what they did. But I would know. So I'd put it out, a story against maybe a chief minister or a party president or something. Mm -hmm. Not against, but just reporting on their activities. So they were all mortally kind of in fear of this political journalist who was incorruptible. Yes. They couldn't get to me in any way. So that clout that I had, yes, exactly the that clout, clout that I had, uh, led me to call them mm. when I was down in the dumps, no earnings. So I suddenly decided, okay, let me call X, Y, Z. So I would call politicians because I was in close contact with them at that point of time until I stopped earning. So I would call, let's say, some politician and say, look, I need some money. Mm -hmm. But never that, you know, I know this about you. If you don't give me, I won't do this. No, that was never the case. Mm -hmm. They would never give me money. They only gave me money because they respected me and my work. And so they didn't understand why I would need money. Mm -hmm. And so they would have made their calls and figured out. Mm -hmm. So I would go to someone and ask for money and they'd give me money because of my status as a good journalist until that point. Mm -hmm. So yes, it was misuse of my position in society, mm. in the sense ki, uh, and that misuse was not a very thought out thing. It was simply a response to a cold turkey situation, where I was in terrible cold turkey, I needed some fix, and then I didn't know what to do, because I'd stopped working. Mm. Now this caused me great damage. You see, trust is the most precious commodity of human life. All these people, so you remember I was incorruptible. Morally, economically, you know, professionally, nothing. So suddenly here I was, please give me money, please give me money, please give me money. And for money, for what? Why would a politician give me money? So I have to build a big story. You know, my mother is so ill or this and that. So the moral degradation mm -hmm. meant that I was suddenly inferior to everybody else around me. Plus, they couldn't trust me anymore. If I could fall to this extent as a journalist, lying, taking money for my drugs, how can I be trusted with a story? How can they trust me with information? They can't be friends with me. So it caused me a lot of problems getting back to the profession. But people also have large hearts. We have to give them credit for that. They understood, a large number of them understood what I'd gone through. And also my story was fairly well known to the political circles of that period. So people have large hearts. When I went back with the money I borrowed with them, from them, and I gave them more, maybe 10%, 15%, uh, when I apologized, saying, I'm sorry, I lied, but I was not in control. I had this problem of addiction, which is why I just came to you mm -hmm. to take money. Most of them understood. This was a big thing. Making amends helps me reintegrate with life. So I go and I make amends. In some cases, it's very emotional. And I always made it a point to return anywhere between 10 and 20% more than what I took. Telling them that, look, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have lied to you. Most of them didn't want to take. But then when they understood the purpose of my returning the money, that it was important for me to make amends for, so that I stay in recovery, it, it worked. Mm -hmm. This works with people that way, because it's financial amends. The most difficult is emotional amends, which is family, which you mentioned. Where there is hurt, 
and it's not a question of just lying and borrowing money. Hurt takes a long while to, to kind of work over. And uh, hurt of such intense nature as an addict can cause can sometimes uh, not be healed even in one lifetime. There will be cases when people are not bothered about you even if you try to make amends. So that integration takes a long time. And that is where I'm still person on greater with at least two people. Long ago they've slammed their doors uh, on me. And with good reason. These two were among the closest to me. So I understand now. So I don't really, I'm, I'm not part of their life, they're not part of my life right now. But I've understood, in my mind, I have apologized, I've made amends. The money I took from them, I've given away to somebody who needs it. Mm -hmm. So I have made my amends. So that is how I integrated myself with life and society around me. Mm -hmm. From my side, making amends is an essential part of this. You don't make amends, you don't reintegrate with life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you don't make amends, it does not matter that society is ready to welcome you back then. It has to be both ways, that society should be ready to welcome you back, should have that understanding, that large-heartedness that you just pointed out. Yes. And also from your side, you must also be able to make amends for what yes. you did wrong. Yes, and that is again a part of emotional maturity. It is the last stage of your old life, making amends. It's the first stage of your new life. It comes virtually at the end of your phase of initial recovery. Most people... Uh, don't gain the emotional strength to make amends. So when somebody says, get lost, I don't care. You don't suddenly come to me after all these years and after causing so much damage, you just don't come to me and say, I'm sorry you did all this, I did all this. Who cares? I've moved on. Now that can be very hurtful to the person making amends. And I'm giving a very polite situation. People can get thrown out, people can get jailed because they've embezzled money from offices. There are legal cases. You know, divorces can get very ugly. Property can be divided. It can be very nasty out there. But when you have re reached a level of making amends, the emotional maturity will tell you that even if you have to go to prison because you did embezzle money, you go to prison. And you come back. That's the only way. People have gone to that extent. If you've killed someone, how do you make amends? But without making amends, there is no new life. A very, very high risk of relapse when you don't make amends. In some form, you have to make amends. If, for instance, you're not ready to accept my amends, let's say, then I simply go to uh, an NGO or a cause that is doing good work and in your name, I give them the money. So I make my amends. To make amends, I think that is what is one of the most basic things that a human being needs to do as well, to be able to live in a society and a community. I wish you luck with uh, the campaign that you are currently conducting in India and hopefully we will be able to start off campaigns of the scale that you have in India here in our country as well. And I want to thank you for sharing your personal experience with us and for sharing everything else that you've learned on your journey till date. Thank you so much. Thank Vijay. you very much and I'm uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me on this. And if there's anything that Bhutanese people require, I'm always available for their assistance because from what I've learned, I think we need to help. And I'm there. Thank you very much again. It's been a wonderful experience talking to you and in Bhutan. I'm sure I'll come back. We would love to have you back, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you.